Today's video is going to be about court procedure. This is going to include how a case reaches the Supreme Court, what cases are cared about in the Supreme Court, how the decision gets made, and how that affects the rest of the United States. Very important PowerPoint. You should watch it probably more than one time before the test. So to start, how many cases get heard? I'm actually going to start at the bottom with the U.S. District Courts. Those are the lowest federal courts. In 2012, there were 372,000 cases that were filed and heard. In the U.S. Court of Appeals in 2012, there were 57,501 cases filed. You can see is that most of the decisions are going to get made here and only some are going to get appealed and heard, heard in the U.S. Court of Appeals. There are fewer of these courts, there's only about 19, instead of over 50. And so they're not going to hear as many cases. They're only going to hear ones that they think actually need to be reheard from the lower court. And then, of course, you have the one single top U.S. court. And in 2011, only 79 cases were heard in front of the court, although they did review several cases on paper only, and they were heard without any lawyers being involved. So they did do a few more than 79 cases. So one of the things we should notice is that between the number that are filed at the U.S. District Court all the way up to the ones that are heard by the Supreme Court, most of them are decided at the lower court level. The Supreme Court is only going to take very few certain cases. Now, here we can see the cases that were requested to be heard versus actually heard by the Supreme Court. And in general, less than 10% of all cases, sorry, less than 1% of all cases are actually heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. They hear very, very few cases. In order to get heard by the Supreme Court, you must be granted what's known as a writ of certiorari. This means you're officially accepted by the court and they're requesting to get the papers from the lower court to hear your case again. Now, this is important because if the case is not granted certiorari, then the decision cannot be changed. So in a way, even though the Supreme Court is deciding not to hear a case, they're still kind of deciding the case. To get cert, four justices need to agree to hear the case, and then the Chief Justice puts it on the docket. This is known as the Rule of Four. Now, how does a case actually get certiorari? The first set are what we call original jurisdictions. These are very rare, only one to four per year. An original jurisdiction means that you petition for a writ of certiorari directly with the Supreme Court. This is the first thing that you do. The only times you can do this under original jurisdiction are if you're an ambassador, if you're a public minister or consul, so you work for the government in some fashion, if you're suing a state, or if a state is suing another state, then this is known as exclusive jurisdiction, which means only the Supreme Court can hear a case if a state is suing another state. If you then receive at least four votes from the Supreme Court Justice, the rule of four, then your case will be heard. Again, original jurisdiction is very rare. You almost never start with the U.S. Supreme Court. Once you get the rule of four, you receive your writ of certiorari. Now, appellate jurisdiction is far more common. An appellate jurisdiction means you are heard somewhere else first. You get heard in a local federal district court. So, for example, if you were in the state of Virginia and got in trouble, your case would probably start here at the state district court. If you didn't like the decision, you could appeal it to the state courts of appeals. If you don't like that decision, you could appeal to the state Supreme Court. If you still didn't like that, you could appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, again, at any time, they could refuse to hear your case, and once they refuse, it pretty much means it's over, and whichever lower court made the decision, that's the one that sticks. If you get found guilty here and you try to appeal, 
the state of court of appeals rejects your appeal, then that's it. Whatever happened here, being found guilty, you're stuck. Now, the U.S. District Court, this is if you commit a federal crime or, it's a, again, if you sue a state or you sue the government, you usually will start here. You could then appeal to U.S. Court of Appeals and then appeal to U.S. Supreme Court. That's the typical way of doing it. We call that appellate jurisdiction because you're appealing decisions you don't like from lower courts and you're demanding that a higher court hear you. And again, they can always reject your demand, and they often do. Only 1% of the cases, well, less than 1% if you're starting here, but only 1% of the cases that even make it to ask for this level get heard. So you appeal to the higher court, as we said. Then, once you get to that time, you can appeal a petition, sorry, for a writ of certiorari from the U.S. Supreme Court. You still have to receive at least four votes from the justices to hear that case, and then you would receive your writ of certiorari. Now, just for your information, Let's look at the kinds of cases that get heard. So again, no court reviews less than 1%, or sorry, the cases that get heard. A court reviews less than 1% of all the cases that they hear in the Supreme Court get asked to hear the Supreme Court. Now, one group of people who can always appeal to the Supreme Court are what we call stay applications, trying to delay or stop an execution. In 2009, the Supreme Court granted two of them, denied 37. So you don't often get these, but you're always allowed to petition the Supreme Court for a stay of execution. They are the final say. Now, most cases here, as you can see, originate in federal court, and usually in the circuit, which is the appeals, the appellate court and only some come out of state courts. The kinds of cases, we have environmental, so looking at um, administrative action, the bureaucracy, Clean Water Act, someone sued the EPA, Communications Act, someone sued the FCC, um, immigration, taxes, here we have other actions and agents of the United States, so again, more suing of the government. False claims, Indian Tucker, National Environmental Policy Act, or the EPA, right? They come out a lot. Voting Rights Act got heard in 2009. Then we have people, the state, or government suing, so if the states did, so there's due process. Um, National Bank Act, Title IX. All things we've talked about. Then we have private litigation, where a regular person is suing. Um, Federal Arbitration Act, employees, so a lot of employee stuff. There's some federal criminal cases. So again, they're going to not care if you're guilty or not, but they'll talk about double jeopardy, the exclusionary rule, did, you know, the Constitution get violated. Federal habeas corpus, so the right to trial issues. And um, civil actions in state courts. And a few state criminal cases. So the right to counsel, right to a jury, right to a speedy trial, search and seizure. Again, they're not asking are they innocent or guilty. The question is, did the Constitution get violated? In 2009, only one original jurisdiction case got heard. So the decision-making process. Once you get to the Supreme Court, what happens? If you're one of those lucky less than 1% of cases that actually made it here, what happens? Step one, they're going to tell you to submit a brief. A brief is a written statement from your lawyer that gives the legal arguments, relevant facts, and precedent for decisions from previous courts on the same type of case. A short, they usually are around 50 to 100 pages long. You submit these usually a month before you have to show up in court. Other briefs that can be submitted during this time period are known as amicus curiae briefs. These are written briefs submitted by parties not directly involved in the case. So your lawyer is not going to be in the Supreme Court, but maybe you care about this. Amicus curiae briefs usually come from individuals, interest groups, or government agencies, including the Solicitor General, who is the chief lawyer for the president. The only thing you have to do is pay a, smart, a small court handling fee to cover the costs. 
The main group that's going to use these are actually interest groups. Interest groups use this as an opportunity to show what they believe should be the opinion to the Supreme Court justices and why. And then, if you care about that issue, even if you're not the one who sued, you can still give your opinion to the court. It's a way of lobbying. The next step will be oral arguments. Each side will get to present a 30-minute summary of the key points of the case, and the justices will often interrupt to ask questions and or challenge a statement. You only get 30 minutes. That's the only time your lawyer's there. You never talk to the other lawyer. You only talk to the justices. And they may eat up your time by talking. Once that hour is up, that's it for the lawyers. And the next time this case is discussed is in the conference. This is bi-weekly, and the justices meet to discuss the cases they have heard. All nine justices are present. It's very secretive. Nobody else is ever in the room with them, so they're just the nine justices. And the justices debate the cases. And they don't keep any minutes, so there's no notes that they keep. So we never really know what they debated and what they said. What we do know from retired justices is they go around in order of seniority, so who's been there the longest, and present their views. Oldest goes first, youngest goes last. Then they vote. At least six justices must be present for the vote to count. The opinion that gets the majority vote is the official decision of the case. Once that vote has happened, they must write an opinion. Most major cases, the court, they'll at least they'll issue at least one written opinion stating the reasoning behind their decision. These written opinions set precedent. What this means is that lower courts must follow the Supreme Court's lead and decide similar cases in the same way. The Chief Justice, if he's in the majority, gets to pick who writes the decision. Sometimes it's an honor, sometimes it's considered a chore. And these are usually submitted about a year after the case has been first heard by the court. Opinions fall into several categories. The majority opinion, which expresses the views of the majority of justices. The concurring opinion, if you agree with the majority but for a different reason. And the dissent, when you disagree and you state why. The dissent carries no legal rule of law. It cannot be quoted in a trial. But it is important sometimes to, if a justice really disagrees. Now in the end, this all works because of the writ of mandamus. The lower courts are obligated. It means they must follow the higher court's decision. So if the Supreme Court decides something, all the other courts have to decide it in the same way. This is what we call setting precedent. If the state Supreme Court decides something, all the other state courts in the same state have to decide the same way as the state Supreme Court. The U.S. Court of Appeals decides something. Unless the Supreme Court changes it, all the other lower courts have to decide it in the same way. States are considered to be lower than the federal court system. So the federal court would be the top, the states would be lower. And precedent. This is when a legal case establishes a principle or rule that a court must follow any case that's similar. This is the Supreme Court's power. All lower courts must use their precedent to make decisions in all similar cases. The idea is this keeps the legal system as consistent and clear as possible. You can't just change ideas from judge to judge, year to year. Law would make no sense. That being said, it still allows for some change, especially within the Supreme Court. We had Plessy v. Ferguson, which allowed segregation, and over 60 years later, Brown v. Board, which overturned that. So things can change. But this is the foundation of the legal system in the United States. And we call that stare decisis. So there's, you can see, there's a lot of vocab you're going to have to know for this class and for this test. So get ready and study, study, study those flashcards.